Praise God. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. Amen. God is so good. Starting at verse 31. Matthew chapter 25 at verse 31, the parable of the last judgment. Starting at verse 31, when the son of man comes in his glory and with all his angels, he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate them in the same way a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right, and he will put the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, come, you who are, who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now listen closely. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will ask him, Lord, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it as unto me. Then he will say to those on the left, those who were unrighteous, Depart from me, you accursed people, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I was naked, and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. But answering, in an attempt to defend themselves, they will say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or as a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not care for you? Then the king will give them this answer. Truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did not, did not. Do it for one of the least of these. You did not do it for me either. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Amen. It's interesting that if you were to ask the modern day Christian, those who at one time or another made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, those who even perhaps walk down the aisle years ago or raise their hand for salvation. If you ask those who even faithfully and sometimes unfaithfully attended the church of their choice, if you ask them why they should merit the glories of heaven, why they deserve to one day see Jesus face to face, why they deserve to walk in the peace and serenity and bliss of the garden of paradise. Many will try to justify why they deserve heaven by telling you some of the things that they were. I was faithful to my denomination. I was faithful to the theology they taught and their doctrines. I was faithful to their fundamentals of faith. Some will say, I was Pentecostal. I was charismatic. Some will say, well, look, I spoke in other tongues. I believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Still others will say why they deserve heaven by talking about the things, listen, they did not do. I didn't smoke. <laughs> I didn't drink. I didn't gamble. Hey, come on, I'm not so bad. I didn't kill anyone. On and on, on and on, 
Pablo, what will they do? They're mentioning all the things they did not do. You see, somehow in their own mind, they thought that not doing those things would give them some kind of certain righteousness in the eyes of the Lord. A righteousness that would allow them entry into the gates of heaven. But in the parable of the last judgment, we don't find Jesus in any shape or form asking them if they were faithful to a denomination. Asking them if they were faithful to a doctrine or a theology, as important as that might be. He didn't ask them if they were Pentecostal. He didn't ask them if they spoke in tongues. They weren't asked about their, now listen to what I'm going to say now. They weren't asked about their sins of commission, the sins they committed. They were asked about what? They were asked about the things they should have done but failed to do. Their sin was chiefly failing to do the things that they should have been doing as born-again believers all along. We call that the sins of omission. Jesus said, I was hungry and you gave me no meat. Jesus said, I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you didn't take me in. I was naked and you clothed me not. I was sick, I was in prison and you visited me not. Again, in an attempt to justify themselves, the unrighteous will say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or as a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and we didn't take care of you? But Jesus will answer to the extent that you did not do it to the least of these. You did not do it to me either. Now, this is critical. These sins in the eyes of Jesus, these sins of omission were so bad so grievous in the sight of the Lord that what did he call them? Accursed. He called them accursed. Their sins were so bad they entered not heaven, but instead they were thrown into the lake of fire that never ends to spend all eternity with the devil and his demonic angels. That's how bad these sins were. They thought they deserved the crown of life and spent all eternity with Jesus. Instead, they will be cast into the outer darkness. Now listen, outer darkness, they're going to spend their eternity with whom? According to Revelation 21.8. They're going to spend all eternity with the abominable, with cowards, with fornicators, with idolaters. They're going to spend the rest of eternity burning in flames along with the liars, the murderers, and the sexually immoral. The sorcerers, the vile, and the unbelieving. But they thought they deserved heaven. Why are they going to spend their life in hell? Not so much because of what they did do, but because of what they did not do. So many. Scores, I would dare to say. Millions upon millions believe that all they have to do to merit heaven is make a confession of faith and stop the sinful life they had been living. Stop committing the sins they were committing. They failed to realize, as many still fail to realize, Jesus doesn't want us just to stop doing the things we were doing. He also wants us to start doing the things that we need to be doing. Do you follow what I'm saying here? Ladies and gentlemen, I mean this with all due respect. Ladies and gentlemen, with all due respect. In many circles, I believe we have to redefine exactly what it means to be a Christian. Exactly what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. We have to redefine what it really, really, really means to be a servant of the Lord, a disciple, and a follower of Jesus Christ. We have focused so much on stopping the sins that we commit. In other words, as I said, the sins of commission. We have totally ignored there's such a thing as sins of omission. 
James said this. Listen to what James said. James said to the one who knows what he should be doing and yet still doesn't do it. That is sin. That is a sin of omission. Knowing that we should be doing as born again believers, knowing the things we should be doing and still not doing it, that is sin in the eyes of Jesus. Enough that one day he'll look at us and say, you are accursed. And in the same breath, James said this, in the same breath, if we are hearers of the word and not doers of the word, we are just like the Pharisees, no better. We are deluding ourselves. We are deceiving ourselves into thinking we are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. We are deceiving ourselves into thinking we are in God's right standing and we are not. Eternity. Eternity costs more. There's something called cheap grace. Dietrich Bonhoeffer came up with that years ago. He said, I think we've made salvation too simple, much simpler than Jesus intended it to be. Eternity costs more, ladies and gentlemen, and those listening on the internet, than just a walk down the aisle than just a confession of faith, than just a raising of the hand. Jesus said this. Now listen, Jesus said this. Count the cost. Count the cost. Count the cost. The belief that we can somehow accept the Lord, and this may offend some people, I hope this rattles and shakes your theology to the core. The belief that we can somehow accept the Lord Jesus Christ and then do nothing for him the rest of our life is not just ludicrous. It's demonic. And I know this will shake some listening. There's a prevalent and popular philosophy that says you can accept the Lord Jesus of, as the Lord of your life and then do absolutely nothing for him the rest of your life. And still you will never, ever, ever lose your salvation. Let me tell you that philosophy is not just preposterous. It's not just ridiculous. It's satanic. There are a few things that please Satan more than to see those who call themselves born-again Christians do absolutely nothing for Jesus. You're all so quiet. <laughs> it's very significant. It is a very significant thing that in every one of Jesus' parables of condemnation, there are different kinds of parables. It is very significant that in every single one of Jesus' parables of condemnation, the sin committed, the sin that condemned them, was not the sin of commission, but the sin of omission, something they did not do. The wedding guest at the wedding banquet the guest at the wedding banquet, Matthew 22, was cast out because he did not have on a wedding garment. The five foolish virgins were left behind. Why? Because they failed to fill their lamps with oil. They should have been, but they didn't. The man with the one talent was called what? Oh, wicked and lazy. Lazy by his master because he failed to do anything with that talent. The rich man was cast into torment because he failed to do anything to help poor Lazarus. The unmerciful servant was called wicked and evil and sent to be tortured in jail because he failed to forgive a fellow servant of just a few bucks, a few dollars. And in the parable of the last judgment, those on the left hand were cast into utter, utter darkness, not because they had committed some grave evil, but because they failed to do something good for the hungry, for the thirsty, for the naked, for the sick, for those in prison, even strangers in need. They failed to do anything. Even when they had the opportunity, they failed to do anything. All of these things can and do 
apply to multitudes, multitudes in churches today all over the world. Is it any wonder? Oh, <laughs> is it any wonder that Jesus said many are called, but few are chosen? Sometimes the greatest gift that we can give back to God is not mere statements of faith or vain repetitious creeds. Is not a few songs and a sermon or some kind of pious, quote unquote, form of worship once a week at best. Sometimes the greatest gift we can give God is a life of service. To become a true messenger, to, to become a true minister. And we're all called to be ministers. Don't kid yourself. To be a true minister to whom? We should all be ministering to the defeated, to the downtrodden, to the broken, to the rejected, to the afflicted. We are all called to do that. So if I said, what have you done for any of these lately? Don't answer. Jesus said we are supposed to be a light to a world in darkness. A light. And he said we are supposed to let our light shine before others in such a way that they may see what? Look in the Bible. What does it say? So that they may see your good works. Good works. And then glorify God the Father. What good works does the average person do? We need to be, with all due respect, we need, we need more doing, more doing, and less doctrine. A doctrine without doing is just meaningless words on paper. That's all it is. The Pharisees majored on doctrines. <laughs> they majored on doctrine. But where did they fail? They minored on the doing. Minored in the service to others. And what happened as a result of that? What happened to the Pharisees? In the end, they reaped what they had sowed. Jesus said it would be more. Oh, my goodness. Jesus said it would be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the afterlife than it would be for them. Why? Because they were all talk and no action. And he also said, now listen closely. You may look at the Pharisees and study the Pharisees and say, man, they were so dumb. What was wrong with them? Didn't they see? Didn't they know to do the right thing? Listen, Jesus said this, unless our righteousness, unless our right standing with God exceeds that of the Pharisees, neither will we enter the kingdom of heaven. There must be a practical outworking of our faith here in the present world. Or it will never endure to the world to come. We need fewer words and more works. That's why I've made a commitment. I haven't asked anybody about it. But we made it, we're going to make a commitment, not just to support Brother Benjamin in India, but we're going to support the Salvation Army to the best of our ability. This is important. We need more works and less words. Saying is not doing. Well done is better than well said. Follow that? People can say they're a Christian all day long, but their actions or lack thereof, will always betray them. <laughs> Am I speaking to anybody here? <laughs> at the judgment, Jesus isn't going to say, <laughs> at the judgment seat of Christ, Jesus is not going to say, well done, you didn't do anything. But come on in to the joy of your master. You are not going to hear those words. 
No, just the opposite. He's going to say, and keep this in mind. He's going to say this only to those who both hear and do. Well done. Good and faithful. You can't say well done unless you've done something. You can't do nothing and then have somebody say well done. You're at work. Come on, you got a job at work. Gina, you know what I'm talking about. What if at work you did nothing all day long? Do you expect your boss, your manager, whoever, your vice president to come over and say, Gino, you didn't do anything all day long, but good job, man. It, it, it doesn't work that way. The only people who are going to hear well done are those who have done something for the master. He's not going to say well done if you haven't done anything. What did Jesus say? I think this is one of the most frightening verses in the entire New Testament. Why do you call me Lord? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, yet not do as I say? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, yet not do what you should have done? The one who hears. The one who has ears and hears and does nothing, the Bible says, is like a person who builds his house on sinking sand. Again, Jesus said this, count the cost. Understand what you are doing in the same way that marriage. Come on. A lot of people here got married. Oh, come on now. You, you, some of you here are sitting next to your spouse. In the same way that marriage is more than just mental assent. <laughs> yeah? Marriage is more than just mental assent. More than just a walk down the aisle. In the same way, marriage to Christ is more than just mental assent. More than just a walk down the aisle. Marriage Marriage is a lifetime. When you got married to your spouse, what were you doing? It was a life of commitment to love the person that you got married to. Supposedly, hopefully, we are the bride of Christ. Marriage to Christ is a lifetime commitment of love and what? Service. I would imagine that if many husbands just said to, your, to their wives, get me this, get me that, do this, do that, do this, do that, marriage would be in trouble. Husbands, we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. We are to provide service for our, our wives, and we are supposed to love and commit ourselves as brides of Christ to Jesus Christ and commit to him a life of love and service. We are supposed to love him with all of our mind, all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our strength. What do we need strength for? Strength for service. Come on. The Apostle Paul said this. He said this unequivocally, and he said this very clearly. We were created in Christ to do good works. That's what the Apostle Paul said. The only Jesus many people out there are going to see is the Jesus they will see either in you or through you. Come on, you've heard that before. The Apostle James took it a step further. He said, faith without works is nothing more than a dead faith. Dead, lifeless, good for nothing, spiritually dead, worthless. Nothing more than a body without breath. Jesus said, it's not those who say, because a lot of people say, say, say. It's not those who say, but those who do the will of God who will enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not those who say they have faith, but those who prove they have faith by doing the will of God. Those who are, what did Jesus say? Not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. In the parable of the talents, the master gave five talents to one person, two to another, and one to yet another. Now look, when he gave them those talents, 
What did he expect? He didn't expect them to do what they could not do with those talents. He doesn't expect them to do what they can't do with those talents. He doesn't expect them to do more than they can do with those talents. But he does expect them to do all that they are able to do. What does the Bible say? According to their own ability. When the day of accountability finally comes, the man with the one talent does indeed come back with something. What does he come back with? He comes back with an empty pocket full of excuses for having done absolutely positively nothing. Nada. Zero. Zero. Nada. <laughs> but he does come back with something. A carefully prepared speech. Prepared to justify his lack of action. For not doing what he knew he was supposed to do. He even tries to justify himself. Now, if you can believe this. He even tries to just himself by insulting the master and even calling him a thief. What? Does it say that? Yeah, it does. What does it say? I knew you were a hard man and you even reap where you did not sow. I knew you were a thief. <laughs> Is it true? He was given a great opportunity. He was given sufficient time to prove himself. Aren't we given a great opportunity? I'm 74. Don't you think God has given me sufficient time to prove myself? How old are you today? Don't you think you've had great opportunities in your lifetime? Don't you think God has given you sufficient time to prove yourself? He knew he was supposed to do this man with the time. He knew what he was supposed to do, but he didn't do it. What did he do? He committed a what? Sin of omission. Now, this is serious. What did Paul say the result of sin was? Death. The consequences of sin is death. Did you hear this? The consequences of the sin of omission is death. You see how important this is? Sometimes our eternal destiny can be, be determined. Our eternal destiny can be determined not by the sins we commit, the sins of commission, but by our sins of omission. Not doing the things we should have been doing. For these are often the sins which do the greatest damage. The greatest damage, not just to yourself, but to the kingdom of God. Do you think the world would be where it is today? That the lack of morals would be as they are today? If Christians were actually doing their jobs? For these sins. For these are often the sins, as I said, that do the greatest damage. Contrasting the two, if you put here, here's the sins of commission right here, and here's the sins of omission right here. What would that tell you? For the average Christian, the sins of omission would be miles high. Well, the sins of commission might be here because people are always saying, Well, I don't steal, I don't kill, I don't rob anybody. I'm not this, I'm not. Well, what are you then? Sins of commission, sins of omission. You see how dangerous they are? What does that tell us? Maybe we're not doing all we should be doing for the cause of Christ. Everyone says, I want more of God. I want more of God, more of God, more, more, more. But yet few do what it really takes because many are nothing but all talk, all talk, all talk. Like a car. Like a car that has a transmission that's stuck in neutral. You look at the car and say, man, that motor sounds impressive. That is really something. Man, the lights are really astounding. You got all kinds of great lights, top, bottom, inside and out. You look at the car and say, oh, look at that, man. Brand new tires, man. Michelin tires on that. Wow. 
<clears throat> the horn works great. The only problem is the car's not going anywhere. It's stuck in neutral. And that's where many believers are today. We're stuck in neutral. I don't do this. I don't do that. You're right. You don't do that. When are you going to start doing that? <clears throat> you know, sometimes I think, how can, how can, we, how can we convince people? you got to minister to, the, to, to those who are less fortunate. You don't even come to prayer meetings sometimes. You don't even get into your word at home. You don't even read your Bible at home. And the parable of the Good Samaritan. A traveler is beat up by robbers and left half dead by the side of the road. True religious people, people who claim to know God, who profess God, pass by. The first person to come by is a temple priest. The priest just walks on by. Why? Because for him, it all boils down to this fact. He loved his position in the temple more than he loved the people, even the people in the temple. And that's what you see today in many churches. Yes. He knew what he should do. He just doesn't do it. What did he do? He committed the sin of omission. He will be accursed and cast into the fires of hell one day. The second person to pass by is a Levite. What is a Levite? A Levite is somebody who helped out in the temple, who prepared the temple for service, who did all those things. Since the priest did nothing, it should be no shock to us that the Levite doesn't do anything either. Why? Because the Bible says that a student will be like his teacher. The Levite who worked in the temple saw that the temple people didn't do anything. The priest didn't do anything. Why should I do anything? Levites were the religious elite of the time. They were responsible for caring for the duties of the temple. Now, here's the interesting thing I find. One of the main jobs of the Levites were this, to offer prayers. Oh, I'm shocked. To offer prayers and sacrifices to God on behalf of the people. Interestingly, he offers prayers for the people, yet he ignores them when he's given the opportunity to do something good for them. What did the Levite commit? The sin of omission. He also will one day be accursed. It's not that they both could not have helped, could have done something, anything. They simply stay right there. I know you're, but I'm going to go get somebody to help. No, they chose to do absolutely nothing. They knew the right thing to do. They simply chose not to do it. What are they guilty of? The sin of omission. And like all sins, the consequence is spiritual death. They were leaders. They were, excuse me, they were hearers of the word, but not doers of the word. And so what were they really doing? They were doing what many do today. They were deceiving themselves into thinking they were in God's right standing. The word says this. Blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. But it also says, judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. God said in the word to carry one another's burdens. Didn't Paul say that, Galatians? Carry one another's burdens and thus, read the word, thus fulfill the law of Christ. Not ignore them. Not overlook them. Not act like the burdens and cares of others people of other people that act like they don't exist. They do exist. Jesus said to those who fail to feed the hungry and the thirsty, who fail to minister to the strangers, those without sufficient clothing, those who fail to minister to the sick and those in prison. He said, "Depart from me, you accursed people, into the eternal fire." which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Let that not be said about anyone in this church. The encouraging, the encouraging words that Paul said to those, if you read Galatians, the encouraging words that Paul said to the people in the church of Galatia, he said this. Now, 
let those words of encouragement by you and for me be for all who hear today. Let what he said to the church be for you and I and for all who hear these words today. What did he say? He said, while we still have the opportunity, let us do good. Not just to those in our church, but let us do good to all people, as many as we can, until the coming of the Lord, so that we may hear, not depart from me, you accursed people, into the eternal fire which has prepared for the devil and his angels. But let us hear, by doing God's will, let us hear one day these words, well done good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. Amen. Well, Father,